This is our third and final video on Chapter 6 from your Operating Systems textbook. We'll be talking about Section 6.4 on deadlock detection. Deadlock prevention strategies are very conservative. They limit access to resources by imposing restrictions on processes. Deadlock detection strategies do the opposite. They're at the other extreme. Resource requests are granted whenever they possibly can be. And periodically, the operating system will perform an algorithm that allows it to detect the circular weight condition that we talked about in our first video. Now, a check for deadlock can be made as frequently as each resource request, or less frequently depending on how likely it is for a deadlock to occur. Now, there's a couple advantages to making a check every time a resource is requested in that they lead to early detection and it's a very simple algorithm. On the other side of the coin, the disadvantage of doing that is that frequent checks consume quite a lot of processor time and that's going to affect your performance. There's a great walkthrough on page 277 of your book uh, that goes through an example for deadlock detection. This is figure 6.10 which uh, you can see on page 278, which you'll reference as you go through that example. So pause the video here, take a look at pages 277 and 278, walk on through this example, and make sure you understand this um, before moving on, and then go ahead and restart the video and take a look at some recovery strategies that we can use when deadlock is detected. Now, once we've detected a deadlock, we've got to come up with some sort of strategy to recover from it. Uh, the four strategies listed here are just some possible approaches listed in order of the least sophisticated to the most sophisticated. First, the most obvious and somewhat naive approach, we get abort all deadlock processes. Now, believe it or not, one this is one of the most common, if not the most common, solution adopted in operating systems. Uh, it seems a bit counterintuitive because now we have processes that are supposed to be doing something and they can't because we've gone ahead and aborted them, but if they're deadlocked anyway they weren't going to be making any progress and they would be taking up system resources. So this makes sense, but again it's a bit naive. Our next option is to back up each deadlocked process to some previously defined checkpoint and restart all of our processes. This requires that rollback and restart mechanisms be built into the system. The risk in this approach is that the original deadlock could recur. However, the non-determinacy of concurrent processing may ensure that that doesn't happen. A third possible approach is to successively abort deadlock processes, just abort the deadlock processes one by one, until the deadlock no longer exists. The order in which processes are selected for ab uh, abortion should be on the basis of some criteria of minimum cost. After we abort each process, the detection algorithm must be re-invoked to see whether the deadlock still exists. The last approach we'll talk about here is to successively preempt resources until the deadlock no longer exists. Now just like in the previous approach, a cost-based selection should be used and reinvocation of the detection algorithm is required after each preemption. A process that has a resource preempted from it must be rolled back to a point prior to its acquisition of that resource. Now, for our last two strategies, the selection criteria could be one of the following, or various other things. We could choose the process with the least amount of processor time consumed so far, the least amount of output produced so far, the most estimated time remaining, the least total resources allocated so far, or just pick the process with the lowest priority. We need to keep in mind that some of these quantities are easier to measure than others. The estimated time remaining is particularly difficult to measure and very, very easy to get wrong. Also, other than by means of the priority measure, there's no indication of the cost to the user as opposed to the cost to the system as a whole. Because of that, and because we don't necessarily know what is important to the user, we may very well end up aborting the process or processes that seem like they have the least cost, but in fact have the most cost to the experience of the user who's waiting for some sort of output 
or trying to perform some sort of computation. Now that we've talked about detection, I would like to refer all of you back to table 6.1, appearing on page 266 of your book. You might recall that uh, in a previous video, I had you stop the video and go read this to make sure that you understand it. Probably a good idea at this point, now that we've talked about all three, prevention, avoidance, and detection, revisit this table, take another look at it, knowing what you know now about those three approaches, and again, let's make sure that we all really understand what's going on with this table. And that does it for this last video of Chapter 6 from your Operating Systems Textbook. I will say, though, go ahead and read the next section on the Dining Philosopher's Problem. It's an oldie but a goodie, and it's a great example of how deadlock works and some strategies on avoiding deadlock when you're dealing with concurrent programming. Other than that, we'll see you with the next set of videos on Chapter 9, which will cover scheduling strategies.